Hello, everybody. Welcome to open source soft develop software development. Huh. Been a day. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there in these difficult times. My heart goes out to you. Today, I want to talk to you about open source licenses. We're going to do sort of a bestiary of common open source licenses and talk about how they work, what they mean, that sort of thing. This could get long, so I'm going to try to keep it as short as I reasonably can. So let's just dive in and get going on. And as always, if I'm going to talk about anything legal, I want to start with the usual disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. None of this constitutes competent legal advice. If you want competent legal advice, you should engage an attorney who actually is trained and licensed to do that stuff. That said, I know some things about what's going on and I can offer you a lay opinion. So I just, like I say, want to look at some licenses and the obvious place to start is with the GPL, the General Public License of the Free Software Foundation. Contrary to some people's belief, the word GNU appears nowhere in this license. This is the prototypical viral license. The terms of the license, which I'm not going to work through in detail here because it's a pretty long and honestly kind of okay drafted document. Um, one of the key ones is that if you distribute software that contains, that's under the GPL, then um, in source form, binary form, whatever, you must make a copy of your source, of corresponding source to any binary you distribute available to whoever receives the binary. Uh, so if you are, for example, a television manufacturer and you include Linux, which is under the GPL, in your television, then you need to make available somehow some very reasonable way uh, the source to your television's implementation of Linux, including any device drivers or whatever that are part of the kernel distribution. So that's a very sort of unusual license model. Uh, when Stallman and his friends came up with this 30 years ago or whenever it was, it was considered a pretty revolutionary idea. This idea of not only may you use the source if you get it, but you must make it available to others, including any changes you make. And that's been pretty powerful. There's sort of two versions of the GPL that are relevant today. Version two is for older soft is mostly older software. And the thing that really keeps it top burner is that the Linux kernel is licensed under version two. The GPL contains a clause that says that, you know, even version two of the GPL contained a clause that said, you may license this software under the GPL version two or any later version. Linus explicitly removed that clause from the license which, by the way, was probably a violation of the copyright on the license, but eh, that's now we're way off somewhere. And so the kernel is going to stay at version 2 forever. Uh, there is no subsequent version of GPL licensing planned for the kernel. Other older software, a lot of it is under this license. The Most of it is that's under V2 is under the v2 or later license terms actually if you look at their licensing and so you could upgrade to v3 if you want version 3 is what all the newer software is using basically and includes some changes designed to prevent something called tivoization which you can google if you want to designed to offer some patent very limited kinds of patent protection in addition to copyright licensing and is generally considered to be a better and more relevant license in the modern world. If you're going to go viral, this is the license you really want to use. That There are some others out there, but this is the, the sort of standard for that. We also have permissive open source licenses um, in addition to these viral licenses. And the 
prototype for me and the one I use in my permissively licensed stuff is the MIT license. And the MIT license is probably a good one to read because it's very, very short and simple. Permission is hereby granted, free of charge, to any person obtaining to deal in the software without restriction. And so basically it grants all the rights. The only condition is you have to include the copyright notice in the software and you have to include the license in the software. And there's also a disclaimer of merchantability and fitness and you know disclaimer of ability to sue about the software. Those kind of disclaimers, you put them in legal documents, they aren't always enforceable. And again, you'd have to talk to an actual attorney to understand the circumstances under what they're usable. But just because you put that in there doesn't automatically make you immune to anything. Anyway, this is about as simple as open source licenses get and has been around a very long time. And to, for me, it's sort of the gold standard of actual open source licenses. The other ones that are floating around that are pretty popular, probably the other most popular one is the BSD license. The original BSD license was had four clauses that were restrictions on what you could do with BSD license software. BSD here stands for the, MIT stands for MIT, the University on the East Coast. BSD here stands for Berkeley Software Distribution. So this was originally a license that Ber the Regents of the University of California at Berkeley had drafted for software they were releasing and uh, the University of California at Berkeley was releasing and so it became known as the Berkeley Software Distribution BSD license. And the original thing had four clauses. No one uses the four clause version of the license anymore. The fourth clause was a clause about uh, oh, I don't even remember what the fourth clause was, but it was something really weird that nobody wanted. And the three clause license, the very sim it looks a lot like the MIT license. The MIT license obviously was inspired by it. But the three clause version of the license, you know, the first restriction is the same as the MIT license. You have to retain the copyright notice and the license. Um, and that the second clause is the same thing, but for binaries. And you gotta watch out for that. If you're distributing something built with BSD as open source, you know, some, something built from BSD license open source or MIT license open source, if you're distributing binaries based on that, you're really required to give some notice somehow and somewhere that the source code's in there. And that is a restriction. You can't legally distribute binaries without at least distributing a license notice to go with them. And then the third clause is about endorsement and promotion. It says you can't use our stuff in your ad, you know, our name or the, you know, our names in, as an endorsement uh, without specific prior written permission, which is kind of a weird restriction. And so a lot of modern projects leave that out and then you get the two clause BSD license, which is literally the exact same thing with that third advertising clause removed. So, you know, these only an attorney can read this expertly and know exactly what all this works and know, have it in their mind the relevant case law and the relevant precedent. But you can get a pretty good idea of what these licenses say just by reading them. And there's really no reason not to be doing it. The third one that's pretty common is the V2 Apache license. Uh, Apache is a web server that has been around for a very long time and they have their own license, which the license terms, a lot of people like them better than the BSD or MIT terms, but they are very similar. Uh, they're all permissive license. So for your first attempts at figuring out how to license, I would pick one of MIT or BSD, I mean, sorry, MIT or GPL. But there are some other things that people use and we should talk about those too, because really there's, uh, you know, this, this talk isn't even gonna scratch the surface of things that are commonly used in a lot of ways, but I wanted to get the ones out there in front of you that you'll hear the most conversation about. 
The LGPL is what's called the Lesser General Public License. This is a Free Software Foundation license. It's also sometimes referred to as the Library GPL. It addresses a specific problem with viral code like the GPL, which is that if I statically compile a library that's under the GPL, then the only programs I'm legally allowed to statically link that with is other programs that are under the GPL because the combined work becomes a derivative work of a GPL product. And some people wanted a license that was viral in the sense the GPL was in this, to the degree that if you made changes to the source code of the library itself, they wanted those changes to be shared but they didn't care so much about forcing you to share things that were built against your library. And so the LGPL, the Lesser or Library GPL, is a license that explicitly addresses this and says it's okay to link binaries without putting them under the GPL. The thing that's really kind of obsolete in this is that nobody distributes you know, binaries linked against static libraries very much anymore. Almost everything is shared. The big, the big exception is the very modern languages. Rust, for example, is all distributed statically linked, and so you gotta watch out for that. And in the LGPL may be a better choice for a Rust library crate than the GPL, uh, depending on what your goals and your aims are. There's the Afero GPL. The Afero GPL, or AGPL, is a license that addresses another limitation of the GPL. And that limitation is that the GPL says that if you distribute binaries, you have to distribute corresponding source. A lot of stuff's web services these days. And with web services, you connect to them with your browser, but you're not distributing any binaries. Therefore, I can use all the GPL code I want in my web service and make whatever changes I want to it and not share them with anybody. And since I'm not sharing binaries, I am not under the terms of the GPL required to disclose my source. The AGPL says, no, if you, you know, give access to services, essentially, then you are also granting, basically, if the person comes into contact with your software, they're entitled to the source for it. There have been a lot of questions about whether the Afero GPL is enforceable. There have been a lot of questions about whether the GPL is enforceable. There have been a lot of questions about whether any open source license is enforceable. And in the US at least, there's essentially no case law. So there's no precedent. These cases all get settled before they come to trial and they aren't brought very often. And so the enforceability of all these licenses and what a court would do with them if, it, if a civil case was presented is a little up in the air. One exception to that, a very strange exception, is something called the Pearl Artistic License, which is a small, simple, to my eye, not super well-drafted license that was involved in a big case, Jacobson v. Katzer, about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I don't know. And that was a big, complicated, messy, horrible lawsuit, which is a tale all its own. But one of the consequences of that was that a judge found, and it held up, that the Pearl Artistic License was enforceable, that, if, that people who used software under the Pearl Artistic License were bound by the terms of that license, that it was a valid document and that it, its terms worked. So we're in the odd position where that's the only US license I'm aware of where we actually have a court ruling. The ruling, thank goodness, is in favor of the open source license. I'm not recommending you use the Pearl Artistic license, but it's at least, you know, it, ha it can claim something that neither the GPL nor the MIT license nor the BISD license or any other license can claim, which is that it's held up in a US court. So, another thing that people have tried to do with software since really the earliest days is so-called put it in the public domain. And the public domain is one of these legal concepts that 
is pretty clear in US law and there are pretty clear ways that it can be there. So for example, software that's past copyright, whose copyright is expired, is automatically in the public domain. So anything before 1930 in the US books, you know, whatever, are in the public domain. In the past, it's been a matter of federal law that federal works produced with public funds were in the public domain automatically rather than being copyrighted by anyone. And what it means for something to be in the public domain is that nobody has any copyright in it. You can do whatever you want with it. You can claim to have written it, can uh, you know use it any way you see fit. And so given the, that's what some people want for their software is I just don't want to deal with this anymore. And so they say, I put my work in the public domain. Well, there's no provisions under US law to do that. It's not even clear you can put work in the public domain unilaterally. And attorneys I've talked to haven't been too comfortable with the idea that you could. So that's a thing to think about. And secondly, like I say, some of the things you could do, like someone could do with your software when you've done this, like claim that they wrote it, you probably wouldn't be so comfortable with. So I don't recommend trying to put things in the public domain. There are a lot of licenses that are sort of public domain simulator licenses that try really hard to abandon every right possible. Uh, some of them with less uh, family friendly names than others. And, you know, it's not clear that what these are doing. If you really want this, if you really want to have the absolute minimum claim you could reasonably have, what most people use these days is something called the Creative Commons CC0 license. If you go look for Creative Commons CC0, this is a license written by competent attorneys uh, and reviewed carefully and provides the, probably the most permissive license that I would be comfortable taking into a courtroom on either side because I think it's clear what it does and how it works. There are other Creative Commons licenses with various restrictions. Those licenses are usually not used for source code. They're used much more often for assets, for media, for books and pictures and video and that kind of stuff, audio. So yeah, uh, you should be aware of the Creative Commons licenses because they're a thing. And really, there's a lot left that we could talk about. I could spend a week going into detail on a whole bunch of open source licenses, but I feel like the important thing is to understand these because they're the ones that are sort of at the basis of a lot of what we do. You know, there's been a lot of concern in the past. I talked last lecture about license compatibility. The other concern's been sort of license pr proliferation. This idea that the number of licenses, new licenses drafted and approved by the open source initiative as open source licenses after review just keeps growing. And a lot of people are really worried about that because it makes the legal situations more complicated when you try to share open source across projects. I'm less worried. I feel like that's a problem that mostly is solving itself. And I feel like it's like a lot of open source problems where it's kind of as big a problem as people make it. And most of the time there's no legal issues. Most of the time there's not even any drama. And it is to some extent the job of attorneys to make drama in advance, to avoid bigger drama later and some of them take that very seriously. And so, you know, an attorney, if you ask them anything, their default position is always to say, no, don't do that, unless you have a good reason to. You know, I would encourage you to keep to this small list of licenses we talked about mostly, because most of the time that's all you need anyway, and it does make things less complicated if we're working in a smaller universe of licenses, but I wouldn't worry too much about running into weird licenses in the world. So hopefully this has been helpful. It's been fun for me to talk about. Again, please stay safe and well out there. And thanks for listening. I will hope to talk to you again very soon.